What do you bring to the party that I don't bring to the party? Business of Architecture, episode 286. Hello and welcome back, Architect Nation. I'm Enix Sears and I'm your host. This is the show where you'll discover tips, strategies, and secrets for running a profitable and impactful architecture practice. Today, I welcome Ignacio Rodriguez to the show. Ignacio Rodriguez runs an architecture firm based in Los Angeles, California, that specializes in luxury residential homes of 15,000 square feet and above. On today's episode, you'll discover the clever way that Ignacio and his wife started their residential design firm and how they grew it over the course of six years to win larger commissions in some of the premium areas of Los Angeles, including Bel Air, Beverly Hills, and Brentwood. Now, if you haven't already, head over to freearchitectgift.com and pick up the four-part architecture firm profit map video that I've prepared specifically for architecture firm listeners like yourself. You can get access to this by entering your name and email address on that webpage. And now, on with today's show. Hello and welcome back, Architect Nation. Welcome to the Business of Architecture show. Joining me today is Ignacio Rodriguez. Ignacio, welcome to the Business of Architecture. Hi, how's it going? It's going beautiful here. Thank you. Thank you very much. It's good to have you on the show. So, Ignacio, tell us about your firm. Sure. Um, My name is Ignacio Rodriguez. Uh, I am the uh, CEO of IR Architects. We are a uh, boutique architecture firm that specializes in luxury residential here in the city of Los Angeles. Now, you graduated from Woodbury University in 2007 out of the architecture program. Is that correct? That's correct. Yeah. Great. And straight out of school, tell me about your career path. Did you go straight into a firm? Where did you go right after school? I did. I did. I uh, was fortunate enough to get a job working at um, at a small architecture firm. Uh, the name of the company is Dean Larkin Design in West Hollywood. Um, they specialized in residential architecture, which is what I always wanted to practice. Um, and I was able to fortunately work on some pretty amazing projects with them. There, I was there for about six years, uh, almost six years. And uh, gained a lot of great, great experience. Now, when you came out of school and you were looking for a position, was it relatively easy to find the position in 2007? Or if I remember correctly, things hadn't quite gone off the rails at that point. Yeah, that was actually interesting times because because, um, the commercial side was paying really well. Um, And I wanted to do residential and the residential department wasn't actually paying as well. So it was... It, was, it wasn't hard to find a job, per se. Um, fortunately, um, I was referred to Dean uh, by one of my professors, which helped out tremendously. But I wasn't, um, I wasn't getting paid the same amount of money that the, uh, the uh, commercial side was paying. But I wanted to practice. I knew I wanted to practice residential architecture. So, you know, I was able to get in there. And, and fortunately, uh, the market had not collapsed at that point. So I got in there, and we were working on some pretty cool projects. And then the and then the market crashed, and because I I was it was a small company and I was integral to the machine, uh, Dean was able to kind of keep us on board, keep me on board through the recession, which was, which I couldn't thank him enough for. Yeah, do you remember what was your starting salary back then? Oof, I would need to do some math, but I want to say, at the time, I was probably making about forty thousand dollars a year. Um, which was, which I thought was good, um, paid the bills at least, <laughs> better than a uh, minimum wage, which at the time I think was like $7, $7, $8 an hour. Yeah. So that'd come out to about $20 an hour or something like that as yeah. a young architect intern. Exactly. Great. So you worked for Dean for six years. What happened after that? Um, at six years, I, um, you know, you kind of outgrow uh, the business. Um, and I decided I wanted to start my own practice. So, um, I, I went off on my own, started my own practice. We were actually called because I was not a licensed architect at the time. So I could only do design work. Um, so I was, uh, we were called, uh, IRDC, Ignacio Rodriguez Design Consultants. And so we, we started that for about, maybe about three years plus or minus two years, three years until I got my license. And, you know, and the way we started that was, um, it was crazy because uh, I would basically, I would meet clients and I would just ask them to pay me whatever they thought I was worth. I just wanted to get the opportunity to work on the projects. Um, you know, I knew what I was capable of doing. And, um, 
And it, it allowed me to kind of get into circles that I otherwise wouldn't get into because people would have to take a risk to, to you know, you're, you're in charge of a, a substantial amount of money. And so it started with uh, small projects and, and, you know, and grew into, you know, what we specialize now, which is 15,000 square foot homes. Okay. I want to, I want to dig into this time when you left Dean's office, you went out on your own. Yeah. Was this something that you'd been planning for a year? Did you set aside money? Tell me, how did you make that transition? Yeah. I mean, we had, um, when we were in college, uh, first of all, my wife, Lauren Rodriguez is my partner. Um, and she does the business end of, of the machine, meaning she does all the books, all the, uh, PR, all the, um, at least manages all the PR manages all the legal side of the conversation, uh, the HR. Um, and so we had been discussing it for a while and I think we had started really the conversation with, I really wanted to become a partner at Dean's office. And so, um, I had an opportunity to, to kind of run the machine for, for about a year before I left. And so I started really to dig into, you know, how do you run a business? How could we make it better? And so um, we had started the conversation with legal, started the conversation with um, uh, the accountants. Uh, and so when I couldn't become a partner there, I kind of naturally progressed into starting my own practice and I had already set kind of the foundation work of what I needed to to kind of do or what the research that I needed to start my own practice which was fundamental you know re regardless of what you're doing you need to be legally sound and the books have to be 100% correct otherwise you'll get yourself in trouble really fast <laughs> especially as people start writing you checks. Sure. Let's talk about that. So that year, that last year that you said you, you helped to run the machine at Dean's office and you started to dig into the business of architecture, what were the key things that you realized kind of that you didn't know going from being just the architect to actually being involved in the business? What were some of the, the, the biggest things about running the business? Yeah. I mean, I think the, 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 you know, you start to understand that, you know, drawing and designing is one half of the, the, the architecture practice. The other half is, you know, what's billable, what can you collect, what's, what are you contractually obligated to deliver upon, what are the deadlines, um, what is the field requiring, you know, staffing-wise, who do you have on staff, how can you accomplish all of these requirements. And so, you know, we were, you know, at, at Dean's office, he, he's very organized with, you know, have very good systems on how you, how you kind of anticipate all of these questions. And so, um he, um, I was able to kind of really get into the conversation of, you know, how much staff do we have? What kind of resources are we, are we running with? Um, specifically, you know, what's billable, what's not billable. And, and especially in a small practice, you know, you can't, you can't obviously spend all your time on non-billable work. You'll, you'll quickly find yourself in a really uh, ugly position. So it's finding that balance that for that last year really kind of taught me how to, you know, kind of how to do it, you know, what, you know, what, what you need to focus on, what you need to make sure you keep an eye on and, and, you know, and where, where your break evens are, you know, where, where, where the bottom line is of your business, what, what those, what those numbers are, what you have to absolutely hit. And then obviously, where would you like to be for, from a profit standpoint? So what I'm hearing from you, Ignacio, is that the, the challenge behind the business of architecture was understanding and managing the resources and at the end of the day, being able to manage those resources so there was still profit left at the end. Exactly. Ideally, that, that's, that's, you know, you obviously want to make some profit. <laughs> if you can, that's, that's the goal. And how did you get your first leads when you went out on your own? That's always the big thing is how do I get these initial projects? Where did your very first project come from? Um, our very first project. So we started doing what we called uh, conflict permits. And um, uh, what it was is people that, uh, that had um, orders to comply, you know, they built, they converted a garage or did an illegal addition or something like that to their property. And um, I would talk to all the expediters around town and say, Hey guys, if you know any of anybody in trouble, man, I'll, I'll help them out. I'll, I'll figure out how to get them out of it. And so that's really how it started. Um, and I think our first project was over in Venice. Um, and Venice is part of the Coastal Commission. It has, uh, it has design review boards and super complicated. But nevertheless, we got that, we got that through. We got them through it. And, and that was actually um, a super small project on a, on a very complicated lot. But the, the builders 
you know, are always working on some sort of project and they're always something changing something. So that, that builder ended up referring me to about two or three other jobs. And then those three, two or three other jobs ended up, the clients referred me to more clients. And then that's really kind of how the spider webs kind of started, if that makes sense. Yeah, excellent. Well, tell me about this, this idea of getting visibility for your firm. So how do you approach that getting seen in the market? Because I've just noticed that you have done invested in PR. Tell me about that. Yeah, I mean, I, I think the biggest part is you gotta, you gotta, I find it that um, some people that, that work for me and now went off and started their own businesses and some of my colleagues that are starting trying to start their own businesses. I find it that a lot of times you, you know, as an architect, you feel like you can design everything and you can to an extent, but you really want to corner a market, at least from my perspective, you want to specialize in something so that when people are thinking about doing a specific type of product, that's what your bread and butter is. And so for us is luxury residential. And so, you know, we, that's what we do. That's what we do. We specialize in homes in the luxury market that are between on the bottom end, like five to 7,000 square feet on the high end on the, from a size perspective on the tall end to about 30,000 square feet. And so you kind of own that market. And every once in a while, you know, we'll take a commercial project for an existing client that absolutely wants us to do it. But, you know, we specialize in that. And because you specialize in that, you learn to become, I wouldn't say an expert, but you have a lot of knowledge in, in the typology, in the program, in the requirements. And so because of that, you know, you, 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 you inherently start to accumulate a lot of knowledge. And so knowledge that I take for granted for most people that have never built a house or are building their second house are learning the, the bumps and bruises and you're bringing that, that expertise, if that makes sense. And so, you know, you're kind of constantly pitching that you're an expert at this typology and you're an expert at, at, at this market and specifically also markets. The markets change tremendously from, you know, even in California, from Northern Cal to San, 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 San Diego, totally different markets, totally different needs, totally different users. And so I find it that, you know, you want to really specialize in what you do. Now you've been, you've had your firm for about six years, it seems. And when you look at the growth trajectory of your firm, was there a certain point where you felt like you hit a tipping point? Because it's one thing to start out doing these kind of very small projects to get your foot in the door, right? These conflicts, these people who get in trouble with the code, and then you're doing that. And it's a whole nother thing to be able to then leverage that as a stepping stone to be doing 15,000, 30,000 square foot projects. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I think that's where, um, you know, you have to, at least for me, we always knew we wanted to do projects of this specific scale. And so, you know, you, you want to stay in that market, right? Like you don't want to, at least from my perspective, you don't want to be doing bathroom remodels in, you know, in the South Bay where it's not in the market that you want to be in. You want to be in, even if you're doing conflict permits, you want to be doing them at least in the, in the, the, the triple Bs, right? Brentwood, Bel Air, Beverly Hills, right? That's, that's where you kind of want to be. And because naturally, there, you're going you're gonna to start building your referral base in that community. And so, you know, the, and the marketing is also going to be there because you, you're, you're becoming knowledgeable in those communities from a soil standpoint, from a zoning standpoint. Um, and so that's, 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 that was my philosophy is we knew the market we want to be in, at least in the community we want to be in. And it was just kind of get your foot in the door and then document it, you know, do as best as you can. I, I know it, you know, we take it for granted as architects that we understand plans or renderings, but you know, a lot of people don't document every step um, and then show, show the world kind of how you do what you do. And you'll be amazed at how, how people find it extremely intriguing to understand, you know, your, your craft. What was the launching point to go from these smaller projects and then finally start to be getting the, the larger projects? What do you think was the, the tipping point on that that allowed you to make that jump? Um, for me, I designed a house. It was pretty early on, maybe my third or fourth home. I designed a house in Brentwood and the budget, the client had a really small budget, tiny, tiny budget, at least for what they wanted to do. Um, but 
but I knew, you know, we had, we had enough money to do like one good move is what I called it. We got like, we got one design element we're going to inject into this house and that's going to carry us through. And I, I put it in the front of the house so that you gave you the most curb appeal. And once we did that house, everybody that drove by recognized it and saw it. And then from there, once we posted on our website, it just started the traction and people wanted it and people were interested in that and, and the budget was within their budget. And that kind of was like step one in us kind of getting into the, the bigger market of leaving the small remodels, small conversions to a big remodel, which is, you know, a full house, re, uh, full house, you know, gut and then injecting, say, uh, you know, two, 3,000 square foot addition to it and then changing the entire architectural style. Ignacio, I know that sometimes firms, when especially when they're small, they're starting out, they have big dreams and big plans. They'll actually do hypothetical or, or speculative designs, right? And they'll mm-hmm. you know, render those out and kind of put those up as examples of their website of what can be done. Is this a strategy that you guys used? Not really. No. Um, here's what I've learned, uh, or at least what I, what I understood was people love the hypothetical in theory, but they can't relate to it. Um, like you can look at a house and say like, oh my God, this house is amazing. But you, if it's not your house, you can't relate to it. So part of what we were doing was, you know, working with clients budgets, like instead of shopping the project, shopping the client, meaning if the client really wanted to build the project, they really wanted to do it, then get in there. Right. Cause that's going to be the ultimate PR to actually have the project built. You can do the five, 10 beautiful renderings, but if you don't build them, I mean, in the end, it's, it's, it's not real. You know, it's, you're working under this, this is like designing a project in space. So for me, it was more, let's find a client that really wants to do it and then do, do an amazing product and work in their budget, you know? And if, you know, if at least for us, for my wife and I was paramount that we always kept our finger on our bottom line. Like what is the absolute minimum we could do this project for, where we don't make money, but, we make sure we at least pay all our bills, right? We break even. And, um, and because of that, you know, you're able to really negotiate with clients um, and really get in there and, and figure out what you can work with, see if it's viable. Sure. So it sounds like one of the strategies that you've been doing is to keep your fees as slim as possible. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah, you remain competitive and also... You, you know, you, people are taking a risk on you, you know, and you got to be willing to take a risk on them. And, and if that means, you know, you got to design, you know, sometime on the weekends, uh, you're not going to charge nobody for it. So what, you know, but make sure that you're doing it again for a good project, not just doing it for something that that's, that's not, that's not, that's not a project that's in your philosophy, or what you want to accomplish. Sure. So one of the one of the issues, of course, with trying to operate on really slim margins is that that can hurt the firm and it can put the firm in a position of of, of danger almost, right? Yeah. So have you guys gotten to the point where you actually have the portfolio now where you're able to command higher fees and not run at such slim margins? Or are you still trying to play that game? No, no. I mean, now at this point, no. We, we know what we want to make. We know what we're worth. And we know the value that we're bringing to a project. So no, we, we don't operate on those margins anymore. Um, you know, you kind of do that to kind of get your foot in the door. And again, right, the way I, the way I see it is you're betting on yourself. Um, and if you're going to bet on yourself, you need to obviously, you need to be confident, know that you can do the job and you're going to get it done in that time frame, And that you're, that you're going to be able to deliver what you're saying you're going to be able to deliver. As you know, I've heard somebody put it, right, the proof is in the pudding, so to speak. So... So you got you to gotta be careful. And, you know, for us, me and my wife, we always saved. We're very, very frugal in what we do and how we do everything. So, you know, we had money saved so that we could actually go out and launch our firm. Um, and um, when we first started, my wife was working at a, at, a, at a real estate company, you know, and she was, she was basically doing a double shift, which was working and coming home and helping me on, helping us on the business end. Um, and you kind of want that. I, I would imagine you want to have that overlap for six months if they can sustain a year. But you want to have a little bit of that overlap because there's a there's a there's a, a loss leader when you get started. You know, of about three to six months, 
and uh, you want to make sure that you know you're you're not just bleeding money for six months. It's it's a little scary. Well, tell me more about that, Ignacio. Yeah, so um, you know, you you know, when you get started, right, you're gonna have to hire at least on my side. You're gonna have to bring in attorneys to set up all your contracts correctly. Um, you're gonna want to create your legal formation correctly, um, and you wanna you're gonna want to make sure that um, that your books are set up correctly. So uh, in that legal formation, your accountant is going to get involved in that conversation, exactly how that's going to go. And the worst part about all of that is it just takes time. You can't, you can't rush it. As much as you want to rush it, you can't rush it. You know, the attorneys take what they take. You, they got to do their job. And then you got to file everything with the state. Um, and, you know, that takes two to three months. And then set up the bank accounts and all that fun stuff. And then you got to buy all the technology. You know, you got to buy your all your subscriptions for all the, the software that you need, all the licenses, and, and then get, get your hardware, get your printers, get your laptops. Um, the, actually, the other big paramount thing that I created was I created a relationship with a printing company because we're architects and we plot a lot, uh, Universal Reprographics. And uh, Steve, because uh, I was sending so much volume with him, volume towards him when I was with Dean, and I told him, I said, hey, Steve, I want to I start my own practice. And he took care of me and he started that for me. And fortunately for us, uh, that ended up being huge because we print so much, you know, and in any project you're printing, you know, thousands of sheets that uh, he gave it to us at such a great number that our clients never hesitated to have printing done, which was huge. Um, they never disputed it or any of that fun stuff. So, um, but all those relationships, right, you set up the, the foundation of your project and, and that takes months. It takes six months in my experience, six to nine months. And you, and it's going to be money that, that basically you're not really working. You're just setting up the business. You said when you started out, you, you tried this strategy of pay us what you think we're worth. Tell me how that worked out for you. Well, for me, you know, I, I, it ended up working out great. Obviously we are where we are and I, I couldn't be more thankful for it, but it was one of those things where, Man, I mean, it was tough because when you first start, you know, you want to charge somebody, whatever it is, a thousand dollars and they want to pay 500 and I kept losing contracts. I think we lost like the first 10 contracts because of money, because, you know, we wanted to get paid a certain amount and, you know, and it wouldn't work. And, you know, you, when you get started, you know, you feel like I'm worth this amount of money and I, I don't feel I should do this for X. And then after you lose, after you get your butt kicked 10 times, you kind of realize, hmm, my strategy is not working. And so, you know, and then you're starting to watch the money keep going out and no money's coming in. And I told my wife, I said, Lauren, what's the difference? What is the difference of me working for a dollar versus working for no dollar because I'm not willing to budge? I said, let's, do, let's just try it. Let's just, you know, let's remove this point of the conversation off, which is just pay me whatever you think I'm worth. And what it did is it forced the client to put a number on the table, you know? And if it's an ugly number, then, hey, guess what? I'm going to be working for less than minimum wage, but it's better than not working. And more importantly, I'm now building towards the portfolio that you need so that I can market myself and I can show other people what I want. And so, you know, you do that. We did that probably 15 times. And then after that, you now have the Rolodex, right? You now have the projects. You now can say, look, on my own, I've done X. And then, and then you can start to, you know, start to kind of be able to negotiate better, uh, uh, at least when, at least negotiate from a point of, well, I've done these 10, 15 projects, not just I'm good at what I do and this is what I think I can do for you, and, but you have no proof, right? You have no, and you know, and for me, it was important that I didn't use any of Dean's work to get my, pro my clients. So, you know, you kind of want to start off on your own and what you do and build your brand. So uh, that, that was, that was, that's how we got to that point. It wasn't like we just came up with it. We just couldn't sign clients. And so, you know, you find a way to negotiate, find a way to nego negotiate on better terms. And when you put that conversation on the table of, hey, pay us what you think we're worth, did you find that people generally lowballed you? Did you find people were generous? How did that work out as a strategy? You know, you know it's crazy. People were generous. 
right? It's like, think about it. It's like if you walked into a restaurant and said, hey, if somebody said, hey, pay me whatever you think this food is worth and somebody des- delivers you a really nice hamburger with some nice french fries and a Coke, you're probably not going to say a dollar. Probably not because we all know what a, co- a hamburger and french fries and a, and, a, and a Coke cost. If you say five bucks, it probably cost the business a dollar to two dollars to put that meal together to make a little bit of money. And and we found that, that most, most of the time we were actually making some profit on the projects. And, but the clients were, you know, we weren't making the profit we wanted to make, but we're making some money and it paid the bills. And they never felt like I took advantage of them, which was the biggest part. Got it. Now, I know that you were, uh, you were involved in a very large project that turned out to be contentious, right? With a, with a developer. And that was maybe midway between the start of your firm? Um, yes. So we, um, we are, we, yes, about midway through our, pra- our practice because we specialize in these conflict permits, right? We called it. Um, one of the clients, not a project that we had designed, but we were designing another project for them and they asked us to help them get out of this, this project. And, um, you know, it, it, uh, it, was, uh, it was challenging, very challenging, probably one of the hardest projects I've ever had a chance to work on. Um, but you know, being everything that it is, right. You, you, you do the, you do, obviously you do your job, you deliver the best product you can, you design an amazing house and you make it comply. And uh, I got to meet, you know, some amazing people at the city who helped us understand the code even more than what we thought we understood it. Um, and, and really kind of help build the relationships with the city. So it was, sure. huge. was that the, was that the Mohammed Hadid project? It was, it was, uh, it was a uh, 901 Stradivacia. Yep. And that house was, how many square feet was that? Do you remember? I don't, I don't, I don't, but I know that we had to reduce it significantly. Um, and you know, without getting into too much details on that project, it was, there was just a lot of, a lot of, a lot of missteps on, on, on the design side, on the city side, on the construction side. And it really put them in a, in a really tough position. Um, and, and for me, you know, we learn from that. You know, you kind of learn from other people's mistakes. I think that I, I find it, what I've learned, at least in my practice, is I tend, I, I tend to want to listen more than talk. And what that means is sometimes when you listen, you learn through a lot of experiences that people are trying to explain to you. And most of the time, you know, you're off to the next topic that you're not listening. Um, and so with that project, I learned so much, so many, so, so, you know, how to avoid all of those missteps in my practice so that we don't ever have one of our projects get to that point, you know, and, and it's hard, it's hard. And then you, you learn a lot. You just learn, but you got to practice listening. If you're not listening, if somebody, you know, so many times, um, some of my, my colleagues ask me for advice and I start explaining to them what I think their first step is. And they're already down to they're like worried about the competition they're going to join. And it's like, yeah, so you're not listening. You got to start the formation correctly. Cause I, as I explain it to them, let's say everything goes well. Let's say you win that competition. Where are they going to write the check to? Where are they going to write that million dollar check to? If you don't have the bank account, if you don't have the right formation set up, if you don't have the right insurance, if they come to you and say, hey, great, let me see your, your, your liability insurance and your general business insurance and your workers' comp insurance. If you don't have any of that, you're going to quickly find out that you can't even take that job that you worked so hard to land. So, you know, you got to just listen. Listen and then keep your eyes, eyes and ears open to, to what's happening around you. And are, are these younger architects or people who are coming to you, when they come to you for advice, what kind of questions are they generally asking? You know, usually they're, 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 they, they're usually past the foundation and they're now working, work, worried about the next thing, which is, you know, how do we design this amazing house and how do we do all, you know, how do we build a website and, you know, how do we get into a, you know, we want to go into hospitality or you know, dense mixed use or whatever it is. And that's all great. But what I explained to them is you got to start in the beginning. Like, what's the name of your practice? Have you checked to see if it's even available? Can you legally do that? Um, at least that's, that's how my mind works. Because if you don't have the foundation done, it doesn't matter, right? A client, do you, you in LA, you, you find, I find that you meet clients everywhere, right? And they're ready to go. And if you're not ready to go, 
they're not going to wait for you. They're going to go find the next person that's ready to go. And so it's just, it's just, they're, 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 they're like five steps down the road. And it's like, you know, they're, they're trying to play baseball. They don't even know what the sport is. And it's like, you just come back and you got to learn the fundamentals, at least my perspective. And so let's say that someone has the foundation, they have the fundamentals down, they have their legal uh, house in order, so to speak. And they, they actually do want to get those larger projects. What's your advice for how they get started doing that? Well, yeah, perfect. Now it becomes great. Now, 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 because I've had that. And so we have a couple, a couple of employees that, are, uh, that were employees that, that have now started their own practice. And, and, and they asked me, you know, and we're good friends and we're in competition with each other. And what I explained to them is, what do you bring to the party that I don't bring to the party? What are your values? What is your firm? What are the core values to your practice that makes your practice different than my practice? Whatever that is, find that out because that's what clients are going to be asking for, right? Clients have already seen our websites. They've already seen our work. They know what we're doing, but what's fundamentally different between myself and your practice? And then you set that. And once you set that, that's your sales. That's your marketing. That's what you are doing. And, and people come in and, and, you know, and, and they fall in love with it, that, that idea of what you do. And, and that's what's going to continue that repeat business over and over and over and over. Architects have a very hard time answering that question. What is it that makes you different, Ignacio? What I'd like to know from you is what's your advice to these other architects about how to come up with that answer? And then what is your answer for that question? Yeah, I mean, I, I think the biggest part is, you know, you could answer that question in two ways, right? You could answer that question architecturally speaking, meaning what your design philosophy is, and you could answer that question from the client's perspective, because you could use a lot of words in architecture. Architecture has its own language, right? And I find that a lot of times, at least for, in my industry, architects tend to go down this this rabbit hole of like this big philosophy thinking, right, of what the moves were and why you wake up in the morning and you, why you're wearing what you're wearing, you know, like this whole, this bigger, larger than life kind of conversation. And that's cool. But clients want to understand it at their level. And it's like simplify the conversation so that they can understand it. Um, and you'll be amazed that, you know, at least for me, clients are not architects. Few are, but most aren't. Um, or at least not, they don't think like architects. They're just normal people that are trying to have a beautiful home built for them. And so for me, our core values is we intend to design a house that is tailored to you, not to me, to you. As I tell every one of my clients, I will probably never spend the night in your home, ever. <laughs> so this house is your house. I am here. I'm purely a conduit to make sure that we take whatever it is that you have in your mind and we make it amazing. We make it functional. We make it real. That's my core. Those are our values. And that's what we stand for. So it's like, as I explained to him, you want to move a wall, you want to move whatever you want to move, we'll move it. As long as it makes sense, as long as I'm okay with it, and if it's structural sound and it's code related, we will move it because it is way cheaper to move that lot, those two lines on paper than it is to move them in the real world. And, you know, and, and I check my ego when I get, you know, when I walk into a meeting, which is, you know, you're hiring me, you're hiring me. I, I believe that you trust me and what I'm going to do. And because of that, I'm going to work day and night to make sure that I don't lose that trust. And that is, you know, I'm going to get in front of every issue that I can. I'm going to anticipate as much as I can. And I'm going to be as transparent as, and as honest as I can be with you. And that's it. And, you know, and basically, you know, I'm here on your team to help you build your house. Those are my, those are our firm core values. Awesome. Well, Ignacio, thank you for joining us. That's probably a good place to end today's conversation. Awesome. Absolutely. Thank you guys for having me. It's a, it's, a, it's a great honor to be on your show. Great. Ignacio Rodriguez, thank you for being here on the Business of Architecture podcast. Awesome. Take care. And that is a wrap. As a podcast listener, I'd like to invite you to two free online educational seminars for firm owners. The first teaches you how to structure your firm to avoid the overwhelm and fires that plague so many firm owners. If you're ready to move from overwhelmed operator to excited owner, visit businessofarchitecture.com forward slash freedom webinar to access this free online training. 
The second seminar you can access shows you how to attract your ideal clients to your firm consistently day in and day out. Go to architectwebinar.com to access this training. The views expressed on this show by my guests do not represent those of the host, and I make no representation, promise, guarantee, pledge, warranty, contract, bond, or commitment except to help you conquer the world. Carpe diem.